Thanks for joining us again, everyone. We have got lots coming on today, so I'm going to do a brief introduction for those of you that are not familiar with Spectrum Centre. Spectrum Centre are spectrum management specialists. Our main flagship product is called Spectrum E, which is an off-the-shelf COTS SaaS solution. It incorporates um, spectrum engineering, remote measurement and an e-licensing capability. In addition, Spectrum Centre offer consultancy services across a broad spectrum of uh, technologies and markets, whether that's coexistence studies, interference studies, or even drive tests for mobile coverage. Like I said, the actual scope of that is, is broad. So as I said previously, Spectrum Me, which will take part of the demonstration for today, has three key modules, e-licensing, technical analysis, and remote monitoring. So the demo that we're going to use will outline some of those key benefits specifically for broadcasting, but it is worth noting that uh, there's a far richer set of features within the tool, and these can be covered either on a one-to-one -one demonstration basis or will form part of our future or previous webinars. So just to look very briefly at, uh, at Spectrum E in terms of key drivers. So benefits of Spectrum Me are the simplicity of the interactions with the software. It has an easy to use interface and workflows. In terms of performance, it, speed of calculations are vastly increased um, against other competitors. And we've eliminated the onerous um, time of training sessions. This means the overall costs for training and time resources have been eliminated. Feedback from our users highlights that the application is easy to use. Adoption and migration from legacy systems have short lead times. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Ross now, who's going to take us through today's presentation. Over to you, Ross. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Sarah. And welcome to everyone who's joined us online now. So I'll just quickly outline the programme for today, what we're going to go through. Um, so initially, we'll talk about a, a brief introduction to some of the broadcast planning uh, functionalities and features. Um, specifically today, we'll be looking at a single frequency network. Uh, so we'll introduce some of the concepts there. Uh, we'll go on to look at the broadcast functions that we'll be using within the product demonstration uh, near the middle and end of the presentation today. And again, as Sarah mentioned, we'll follow up with any questions and answers at the end of the presentation, so keep them flooding in. So I'll move, move on to our first slide, which is our single frequency network. So, so what is a, a single frequency network? Um, so you might hear multiple frequency networks, single frequency networks as terms used when describing broadcast networks. So the main difference between a multi-frequency network and a single frequency network is that the single frequency network, all the transmitters are operating effectively on the same frequency. They're all synchronized in time. So, so all the transmitters send the same data stream um, to the service area. So what benefits does this bring to, when designing a single frequency network? So it allows us to increase the, the frequency efficiency, so how many times we can utilize a single frequency around an area. And it will also, for the receivers, reduce the field strength variation as well, because if we've got multiple signals being received at the receive locations, um, the field strength variation will, again, um, be more certain. So when we're designing single frequency networks, what we, what we must do is minimise the self-interference um, and the calculations that we do when we're designing the single frequency network will um, make sure that the, the synchronised signals that are received um, don't interfere with each other. Um, and again, what we want to do is maximise the, the wanted signals produced by the other uh, transmitters within the, within the network. So single frequency networks can be rolled out individually. Um, they could be used for small infill areas or they can be used uh, to create national coverages. Um, and you've also got the ability with a, a multi-frequency network um, to sort of create a hybrid approach where you've got kind of national multi frequency network and then small areas just to make sure you're getting coverage um, 
around your service area um, are used, uh, SFNs or single frequency networks are created in those areas as well. <clears throat> so traditionally, um, when designing single frequency networks, broadcasters have used um, effectively reuse patterns. So looking to understand, um, lo looking to lay out a number of transmitter sites in a generally hexagonal pattern, and then start the design from that process and changing the parameters to to create the the final network design. So today, what we'll be going through is an engineering workflow um, based on the single frequency network. Um, and again, within the single frequency network, as we get deeper and deeper, um, we'll find out there's there's many different technologies, um, depending on what part of the world that you're operating in. Lots of recommendations as well in terms of the parameters, and then obviously lots of end equipment as well that you can utilise. Um, so all this has to be taken into account in any network design. So the first thing that we're going to do today is prepare our simulation environment. So I'll show you three ways that we can add stations, um, either by importing from our data stores, which is effectively a database of sites. We can import an, from an existing list of, from a CSV file, and we can also import sites um, through connecting to an external service uh, via our API. Um, and, and pulling the sites in. So I'll show you an example of that. <clears throat> uh, we'll look at some of our kind of first steps in network planning. Um, and what I'll be showing you today is identifying suitable site locations. So rather than using a, a fixed grid when we're adding our stations, what we'll do is we'll use what's called the K-means algorithm. So this is taken from cellular planning. Um, and it identifies good locations to, to place sites into. Once we've got our sites in place, the next step is to understand what coverage those sites will give us. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. Um, ideally, aiming to, to meet and exceed the coverage objectives that we set for ourselves. And that can be in terms of population points, uh, vector polygons, or even uh, line vector lines um, simulating a, a road or a rail network that we, we require coverage over. Um, so we can show you uh, how that can be done in Spectrum E. And then to mitigate as much interference as possible, um, we can have a look at some of the interference maps that we can create and just step through the process of how these are created within Spectrum E as well. So that's a brief overline of what we'll be covering. Um, we'll go into detail of a couple of the uh, specific items. And the first one is the, the K-means algorithm. So what this does um, is identify the, uh, the, the best locations um, to place transmitter sites. So if we have a, a population map, we can use the k-means algorithm to effectively what happens is the, the population points are clustered together and then in an iterative manner the, the algorithm goes over and identifies the, the best location within that set of clusters um, to, to maximise the number of population points that are uh, effectively covered by that um, by the, the placement of the, the transmitter site. Um, so we'll do a practical example of the, the k-means algorithm in action, just to show you how that one works. Coverage studies within Spectrum E. Um, so again, there's several advantages, as Sarah alluded to. Um, in terms of coverage study, um, the results are very easily reproducible. If you put the same parameters in, you're going to get the same results out. Um, the, the simulation performance, and again we'll touch on this within, within the demonstration, um, but we've actively put a lot of development input into maximising the output performance, so it, there's no longer the waiting hours for a, a coverage study to run. 
um, we can get the outputs fast, which allows the team that we're working with to iterate over those, um, redefine parameters, run the outputs in a, either a couple of minutes or even in some cases a couple of seconds, and get the get the outputs um, for use. The transparency as well is very important, especially for regulators, for broadcasters. Um, they want to understand how the model's been implemented, and Spectrum Centre provides documentation on the implementations of various models, and uh, we're looking at doing some further webinars on specific models as well, and um, propagation models, and how they've um, been implemented and can be used as well. So for our SFN, um, the various coverage objectives, um, so <clears throat> a couple of the parameters that we'll be, be dealing with um, through the example is what's called the guard interval. So as we um, synchronise our signal, um, in order to allow it to be decoded properly, a guard interval is introduced. And that can be, depending on the, the code rate, the modulation, etc. Um, this can be adjusted in order to minimise the, the self-interference from the network. Um, so that's depending on the, the throughput and signal to noise as well, um, are, are some of the parameters that, that go into to designing the network. So here's a screenshot from Spectrum E, just showing the, the interface and some of the, the guard interval parameters that, that get put in. Um, so, yep, so this sort of describes a couple of the, um, the, the parameters that we're going to input. And again, depending on the technology that you're using, there'll be tables, um, equipment manufacturers will produce information um, and recommendations from either the ITU or the specific body that um, standardises uh, the equipment. So that's where you can find that information and uh, we'll cover that as we go through. So we'll start the demonstration. Um, go into Spectrum E. So loaded through the web browser, we can log in. This will take us initially to our map of the world. Um, so for the first function, um, what I'll show is importing stations um, using our API, um, a, a connection to a database that we've made. Uh, and we'll start from this test point one. So we can zoom in on the map just to understand whereabouts this item is. Um, just over here in the USA. And what we can do with this object, so if we go to our network page and highlight the object, we can use the API that's connected to the FCC uh, LAN mobile database. If we click in here, the parameters of our proposed station will be input. Um, we can set a search radius to identify how far around this point that we want to query the database and pull out the information. What else we'll do is we'll expand the frequency range um, and then import these as an object type. So what this will do here, it's a, a call via an API um, and it will pull down the all the stations within a 200 kilometer radius of our site here. Um, it will identify between the frequency band and very quickly we can import a number of stations. So in this example, we've, we've input 2,700 stations. And um, we can see that all the parameters of these stations have been pulled through from the database. So that connection that we made to the database has pulled down the information. And then we can start from any existing network. So this doesn't have to be, this example specifically LAN mobile, but this could be any broadcast a database that you have that we can make the connection to. So another way that this this can work, if we just go back out to our map and we can see just on the map that that, that large number of stations has been placed on our map and 
doesn't degrade the performance in any way in terms of scrolling about the map as well. So we'll just go out and do another example within the, the UK this time. So this is just to show the, the data store functionality that we have. So the data stores are effectively databases and it's our own way of storing and manipulating the databases, searching through the databases within Spectrum E. So here we have, as an example, database. Again, this could be a, an existing broadcast database that a, a regulator or a spectrum manager has. This can be a database managed by the ITU. So we have connected to this database and we update it in a regular fashion. Um, and also we have the, the ITU forms for frequency coordination um, and assignments available as well. So as an example for the ITU database, we've got a large number of record, almost 300,000. From here, what we can do is we can start to filter this database, identify the area that we're interested in. So I've got a, an example I've prepared that if we look at this location in the UK, um, put a search radius around here. And then quickly we can see that that 300,000 has been filtered to, to have 2,000 2, sites. Then we can identify a specific band that we're interested in. Uh, we're able to filter the band. Again, we've, we've filtered a bit further and got a, a number of less sites. And at any point through this, we can select all the sites and then send them to the map. What I'm interested in for, for our example today is a specific site that's within that area um, on a specific frequency. Um, so what we'll do is we'll select that site, send it to map, we'll send it as a TXRX object here. So we can zoom in on that site um, just by selecting the object and mapping the selected object. So you can see it's very easy to move about the interface. Um, very easy to filter the, the vast data sets that we might have around the, the sites. So what we're interested in doing for this example is we're gonna create a small SFN network around the Bristol area, uh, using some of the features, the k-means, uh, the coverages and population um, polygon covered functions uh, and also look at the interference of that SFN network and how the parameters change and the, the maps that we can produce with that as well. So the first thing that we're going to do is import some vector layers. Um, so for this example I've prepared and already uploaded um, a population points and a boundary of the area. So we'll just turn those on in our map we can see the individual population points. So this can either be taken from census data. Um, you could have polygons of kind of local authority area, for instance, and looking to get coverage over these. Um, but population points is, is definitely a, an interesting one for broadcasters. So we'll be looking at that today. The next thing that we want to do is create some additional sites. Um, to infill some of this area. Um, so again, this is a sort of fictional example and um, what we can do now is create some sites and again, created these already and what we'll do is we'll import these as a CSV file, from a CSV file, sorry, just by choosing the file, pressing open and this CSV file will be made up with the individual fields that we require. Um, and what we've done here is we've imported these three potential sites that we can use for our, our mapping. So we'll just check out where these are in the map. So we've imported them currently within the boundary. And what we want to do now is use the k-means algorithm to identify the most suitable locations um, from the population point data that we have here as well. So what we can do is, if we select these sites, we can use the k-means function 
what this will do is it'll ask us for the, the maximum uh, distance to create the clusters. Uh, once we've created the clusters, it'll run the algorithm and then move those three stations to more suitable points to start designing our network from. So again, this works very fast. We can see as we look at our map that we've the three sites have now moved to what looks kind of visually as more suitable points. Um, one between this sort of main cluster of the population here, another one out, I guess, covering this population point, uh, these population points, and again on this side. So as a start, um, a quick way to start designing the network, um, we can have a look at, uh, based on distance, uh, creating these clusters and moving the sites to, to suitable locations. So now what we want to do is understand the coverage that we're going to receive from these sites now. So this, could, once we've looked at the coverage, we can then modify um, the locations of the antennas uh, or the transmitter sites. So again, based on a number of parameters, um, there might be better locations to host these transmitter sites than the kind of high level um, locations that we've got here. So again, so the, this K-means algorithm will automate a lot of the, the work in terms of placing sites and rather than just using a, um, a repetitive pattern when we're placing our transmitters, we're able to identify the best locations based on the population distribution as well. So we're not just looking at a, a fixed grid of sites, we're looking at placing these in, in better locations to start with, to start our planning from. So what we're interested in doing now is understanding the coverage from these sites. And the way we can do that is today we're going to look at the, the 1812 propagation model. Um, we do have a number of other propagation models, um, 1546, um, 525, 526, um, and a number of others as well. Um, but today we'll be looking at the 1812 model for, for this example. So we'll set our parameters here, um, going out 100 kilometres. Um, we already have the terrain and clutter. Uh, data files loaded in the background. So in, again, for the entire world, um, out the box, Spectrum E contains uh, clutter and terrain data for the entire world. We'll leave the, the standard parameters and put the profile sampling up to 2000. So that roughly equates to a 50 meter terrain grid that we're going to look over. So we'll run this, run this now, and we can see the, the multi-processing capability of Spectrum E. So rather than waiting hours to sequentially go through each of the coverages, um, out to 100, 100 kilometres, um, at 50, km, uh, 50 metre sampling, we're, we're running these in parallel. Um, again, running on our server, um, this doesn't take too long at all. So we've gone out a large distance. Um, we've used 50 metre for the, the grid resolution and we've received results um, very quickly. So that initial step was to create what's called a path loss matrix. And what that does is that calculates the path loss from the transmitter out our radius um, of the calculation distance. The next thing that we want to do here is identify um, the field strength that's created from each of these stations. So here we can do this individually just by selecting a station. We'll go to our talk out field strength receive map. We'll just put, um, this is station two, I believe. Now apply to the selected object. Again, we can do it to all objects if we want to see a composite coverage of the sites. We'll press process. And then we'll be able to see the, the output um, coverage from this, from this specific station. So that seems to, we have a bit of coverage in this area here. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll create a, a composite coverage map for all the stations. So 
So imagine in this example, there will be a bit of overlap. Um, and that's when our next stages within the planning process would be to identify the best stations to use for network planning and remove or move site of the other stations as well. So here we can see um, with the legend, another thing that's interesting, certainly with um, our uh, broadcast planning is to have different palettes for either fixed, mobile um, and rural. Um, mobile and outdoor uh, equipment types as well. So we can set individual um, individual values, discrete values within our palette as well here. So now that we've created our coverage map, um, what we would do is optimise this, identify the best stations and the best positions um, to use within the, the map. And then what we would do is identify the um, the interference that's caused by having all these three sites operating on the same frequency uh, within a single frequency network. So we've got an inbuilt function within Spectrum E to do this. It's called the, the SFN interference map. And what that does is as we select the stations that we're interested in for our network, we can do our SFN interference map. And what this does, this creates a C to N over I map, um, a C to N over N plus I map um, for the specific parameters that we put in. So again, depending on the technology, um, the guard interval, useful signal length, and contributing length values can be changed, altered. Um, and depending, again, this is based on the, the modulation and uh, other parameters that we're looking for when we're designing our network. So these should be identified at the early stages of the, the planning process. What we can do now is calculate the SFN map. And again, very quickly, we can get an output showing the different um, Again, C to C over N plus I map, um, showing our different categories um, of values that are being output here. So we can initially see that there's quite a lot of areas of weak signal in the red. Um, again, quite a lot of these are on the water. It's just really what's in the, the polygon boundary that we're interested in in this case, um, and on, on the land on the other side, I guess. Um, but we can see that. Using those parameters, um, there's quite a high area of um, good and weak, but ideally we want it in the strong, excellent and superb areas. Um, so then we might go have a look at the, the parameters that we can use, see how we can change that, and then come back with some new parameters. Um, so by changing the guard interval, um, either by increasing it or decreasing it. Um, again, depending on the size of the network. So if you're looking at a small network or a big network, again, you'll be using different parameters. Um, we can change the useful length and change the contributing length as well. Recalculate the map and again, now we can see that a lot of the red areas have been removed, removed by the new parameters. Um, so then we can see very quickly that the, the quick iterations that we can go through with the tool um, to produce uh, better, better maps for our outputs um, and getting better coverage as well for, the, for our area. So what we can do now um, is now that we've covered the the SFN interference, um, we can have a look at the population covered capabilities within Spectrum E. So again, this is again very high level live demonstration. So what we'll be looking at is identifying first of all with the polygon using an individual site, 
um, what percentage of that polygon is covered, and then we can look at the population points and identify the percentage um, and the number of population points that are covered and to what signal strength level as well. So first of all, we'll just clear our predictions. Um, and we can just have a look at our prediction from station number two. So we can see that this is a small area that we've recovered to our, our current uh, threshold value. Um, and what we want to do is understand what percentage of the polygon at this stage is covered. So you could have multiple polygons breaking this larger area down into several local districts. Um, and again, it, just to show you the functionality and how Spectrum E uh, works here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the covered polygons function. What we'll do is we'll select our vector area. So that's the, the Bristol boundary here. Um, look at the prediction. So that's our station two prediction. And then what threshold we're interested in for that prediction, which is a DBU type prediction. Process that. So we can see here that 14% um, of that's covered. Um, and we can also download the CSV. So again, that's interesting if we've got a number of uh, polygons. Um, and we can see for each individual polygon what percentage is covered. For this example now, we'll look at using the population point data. So that's the individual population points. And again, this can be taken from census data um, and shows attached with that is a, a population count for each of the points within the, the data set. Again, we'll use the covered polygons functionality. Click on this. Go to the population points this time. Um, for here, we'll look at the station two coverage. Identify our threshold. Press process on this one. And here we can see the output so what this in indicates is for the individual um, population point, which is one of the lines, we can see the percentage. So for here, they're either covered or they're not for the polygons. We'll see the power received at the location of the population point. And then any other parameters that are associated with the data set. So we've got um, this is some geographic information and then population count at each of the points. Uh, within the population point. So that's a way that we can then, um, as we scroll down to the bottom, we can download as a CSV file, have the, the information emailed to us um, for further analysis to identify what percentage um, or what number of the points are covered um, and if we're meeting our, our coverage um, criteria at that point. So that's a, a very brief um, very brief demonstration um, showing how we can quickly import uh, files, um, import sites, either from a database, through an API or from a CSV file. How we can quickly use the k-means algorithm to identify suitable locations based on the population distribution um, for putting our, our new sites. We then showed the, the speed of the coverage calculation, so going out large areas um, with a, a high um, terrain resolution quality um, and how we're able to, to run those calculations in parallel um, so it doesn't take up hours of our time waiting for a, a coverage calculation to run. We looked at the SFN interference calculation. Um, interference map calculation, and we're able to show that the the output C over N plus I maps that we can produce through that, and how the guard interval and the the setup of the technology influences the the output maps that we get as well. And again, the speed of the calculation, the speed of the the output, the processing, this can be done for very large networks in a, a short period of time as well. We finally covered the population coverage 
um, functionality and through that we were able to look at how we can um, identify the population points that are covered and uh, we can identify from a vector polygon area what percentage of that's covered as well so um, that's um, what we're looking at covering in the demonstration today so I'll go back over to our slides um, and take a break there for any questions that have came in through the demonstration today. Okay, Ross, a couple of quick questions that we've had come in. Does the tool have the ability to model MFN? MFN? Yes, so certainly that's something that we didn't cover today, um, the multi-frequency network um, aspect. And again, there's there's a number of specific functions to MFN. Um, again, the coverage, uh, you would still use that sort of um, those functions, um, but the MFN functions that again, if there's a specific function or a specific task that you're trying to do, just put a bit more detail down and we'll get back to you. Um, otherwise, we could organise another demonstration um, on that topic as well. Yep. Um, so the vector files um, within the user manual in our documentation page, it describes exactly the, the process for importing data. Um, the vector files themselves generally need to be WGS84 um, projection. Um, they can either be shape files or KML files. Um, both are supported for import. Um, and yeah, I can probably show you a short demonstration of, of how to do that as well. Um, so again, that's just from our map page. We would use the vector options, um, and just here I kind of briefly covered it. But for the shape file, it would just be the three um, three parts of the vector file that we would import, um, and also the the KML support as well that we have. Just choose the files that we're interested in, and then press upload. We can also, once the the files are imported, we can change the colours change the, the line width as well of the vectors. So if we update that, we should see a blue outline um, around our, our, our vector area. Um, so that's briefly how we, we cover the, the vectors. Okay, that's lovely. Thanks for that, Ross. Um, again, just turning to, to vector layers, how are vector layers imported into Spectrum E? Yep, so that's just kind of following the similar lines to what we're sharing so through vectors and um, I should have a, a sample here I think um, yeah we'd find a, a sample of vector information um, and for the shape file we, we, we just need to make sure we highlight the three uh, three files here um, and the KML files as well we can we can import those um, so again, we do have support for vector lines, vector polygons, and vector points as well. So depending on the the nature, so maybe if you've got a road network, you would do lines um, for district boundaries or different areas. Um, you can have a look at a look at polygons. Um, so hopefully that answers the, the question. If you, if there's any further follow up, um, just send us a message on that one. That's lovely. Thanks for that, Ross. We have got another one with regards to the ITU Brific data set. In your experience, how accurate is this um, around the world? Yep. So again, it, it really depends on the, the countries. When was the last time they've, they've updated data to the, the ITU data set? Um, so it, it does vary, I'd imagine, from, from country to country. Um, and again, yeah, it, it, it very much depends country to country. Um, I've not a massive amount of interference uh, of experience using the specific data set for a specific country, so I can't really comment on that one. Um, but obviously, once you start using it, once you start downloading that data set, you'll, you'll quickly identify the, um, the, the quality of that data set as well as you're using it in terms of sites and uh, emissions that are already um, located in the on the map and in the data set so um, yeah certainly it probably will vary country to country and um, 
yeah, it, it depends the project and a lot of other stuff, how, how good the quality is for, for the work that you're carrying out. So That's great. Thanks for that, Ross. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple of other questions, um, do please do use that tool. Okay, one more question that's come in here. It's about the K algorithm um, used uniquely on population data. Does it use, does it consider other variables such as terrain, propagation model, etc.? So that's the K algorithm that we covered today. Yep. Does it consider any other variables such as terrain, and propagation model, etc.? Yep, so the K means algorithm um, doesn't take into account the terrain or propagation models. Um, so it just looks at the distance and between the, the population points, clusters them together, um, and then identifies within those those clusters the best points um, to place the transmitters to serve those clusters. So um, that's why we the next stages of the planning would be to look at the, the coverage from the, the initial site locations um, that the K-means algorithm has suggested. Um, look at the, the coverage from the sites and then do the further um, design work in terms of specifying partly antenna heights, uh, powers, um, and the other information that we, we need to do when we're designing the, the broadcast network. So um, in short, um, the K-means algorithm just looks at the distance between the population points and um, when it's clustering them, um, rather than taking into account the, the uh, terrain propagation models, et cetera, as well. So I um, hope that answers the, the question there. That's lovely. Thanks for that, Ross. OK, before we finish, any final questions, please do drop them in now into the toolbar. Otherwise, like I say, you can follow up by email to us and uh, we'll, we'll respond accordingly. just like to take this opportunity to say thank you, for Ross, for joining us today and presenting. Um, like I said, you'll receive uh, an invitation for our next event, 23rd of April, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Any colleagues that were not able to attend today will um, get an opportunity to register for this event. We're running it again this afternoon at two o'clock. Um, if you'd like to share um, share today's event with them, either with the recording or the link, please do feel free. Thank you everyone for joining us today and um, we look forward to joining you again, for you joining us again soon. Thank you everyone.